This is Mary's response. She said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And what we're going to look at today in our study after, after we have a word of prayer, we're going to look at four key words in her response to Gabriel's message to her from God that's going to involve her life in a dramatic way. Her life will never be the same, nor should ours. When we have a visitation from the word of God to our souls, that visitation of the word of God should bring such a revelation and insight into the destiny of God that he has chosen for us. It should be a life-changing or a process of life-changing. And Mary's response to this enormous message brought to her, you can read that. She says, bond slave, behold, that's one word, bond slave of the Lord, that's second, third, be it done to me, Fourth, according to your word. We're going to take a look today at those four words. Behold, bond slave, be it done to me according to your word. So let's have a word of prayer and prepare ourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth. These are words that are just dynamic from the soul of Mary back to God. Well, what, what am I going to tell Gabriel? What am I going to tell the Lord, Mary? This was Mary's answer. You go back and you tell the Lord. And what she says from the depth of her heart is just enormous. And so we're going to, we're going to break that down a little bit and take a look at it today so that we might see the character in a believer that God is looking for, the character in the life of a believer that God is looking for. Because Mary had it. And her response shows she has it. So let's pray. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be uh, sins of the tongue. What should I do to get out of carnality and back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? which one of his great responsibilities teach and recall. That's in, you, know, you should read John 14, 15 to 16 because it tells you the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He, as the spirit of truth, he's described as the helper or comforter and the spirit of truth. And what he teaches you, what Jesus teaches there is in regard to that. What I'm interested today is for us to be in a position where he can teach you and can recall it uh, to your life growth experiences. Uh, so where do you get that idea that I can be removed carnality back to spirituality? First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, that's where carnality is. If we will confess our sin, if we will name the sin, God the Father will forgive and and that it says God is just and will forgive us our sins and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, a lot of people have the idea that they have to ask God for forgiveness. You need to read 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that's our part. God's part. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a God, there's a, 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 our part, a believer's part, and there's a God part. My part is if I confess my sin, his part is that he is just and forgiving and will cleanse me from that. That cleansing takes me back to the cross as a believer when I confess my sins is for sanctification, not for salvation. 
And it removes me from 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. It removes me from carnality back to spirituality where the Holy Spirit can. Listen, the whole Christian life under the new covenant is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in Bible study is where it's essential. That's where, that's where he connects. This is where he does his deal as the spirit of truth. Well, I'm going to give you a moment to do that. <laughs> and then I'll have a word of prayer. What are you supposed to do now? Look, not go to sleep or go to the bathroom or go get a drink. What you're supposed to do is confess your sin. This is a serious moment. Your responsibility, if there's any mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, you're to confess them. Name them, cite them to God, and let's, let's get on with the Lord's business. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm just telling you. Our Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this study to our life as the great teacher. And as a result, have it in our frame of reference in our soul because we, we have learned it, we've understood it, and believed it is now in our soul as a principle of faith that we can walk by in our daily life. I pray today as we look at the bond slave of the Lord, what does that mean? I, am I a bond slave of the Lord? What does that mean? Explain it to us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is what we're going to absolutely look at. What did the Lord, what did Mary mean when she refers to herself as the bond slave? She says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your words. See, those four things now are really important. What did she mean when she uh, refers to herself back to God, refers to herself as the bond slave of the Lord? What does she mean like that? You see, here's what's important when you read the context 26 through 28. She said this after Gabriel had brought her a special message revealing the directive will of God for her life specifically for now. And it, it was about virgin, her virgin motherhood. That's really important that you understand that. He, he laid out the details in the message. There are details, and we've studied these details. He laid out in details the details of the directive will of God regarding virgin motherhood. You know, the fulfillment of Isaiah 714 that we've talked about. It is interesting that today... You don't hear Christians talk about, I, I, I've been a Christian since, well, uh, forever. <laughs> Not forever, but a long time. I've had pastored this church for 47 years. I never hear Christians refer to themselves this way. Mary did. And listen, she's not saying this to a, 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 a public or in a public arena. She's saying this in a private, in a private setting, with with the angel of the Lord Gabriel, in the presence of God. The presence of God, where He called her the favored one. My favor is upon you. And as a result of that, she identifies herself as the bond slave of the Lord. That's a, that's a powerful idea. God didn't call her that. She said that to the Lord. I'm your bond slave. You're the master. And I'm the servant. And here's what she said, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You're the master, and I'm the servant, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't want your job, and my job is pretty heavy. 
being a servant. It's a humbling experience. And yet it's a powerful one. John the Baptist said that when he realized that Jesus was the Christ. And he describes, describes his position as the, the main prophet to the nation of Israel in the time of Christ. I'm not worthy to, uh, to untie his sandals. He's first and I'm last. He's great and I'm least. What is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ is the master and I'm the servant. Now, maybe you really do understand that. I know, I know you probably hear people preach on it, and you probably would like to ha believe that to be your life. Maybe it is or maybe it isn't. It depends how you respond to the directive will of God when he lays it on your plate that this is what I want from you now specifically. And he does it by revealing the word of God to you. And how you respond to that will determine on whether you are a bond servant, a bond slave of the Lord, where he is the master and you're the servant. His will always trumps yours. His will always trumps yours. Now, how much do you know about the will of God? The word of God brings you to the will of God, and the will of God brings you to the work of God. How much do you really know? Listen, it is the, when you understand the servant position, you understand the humility position of, of grace. Well, we want to take a look at that today. We want to take a look at that today. And while we don't hear that concept much anymore, sometimes we miss when we study passages of Scripture, sometimes we miss important words. We don't do it intentionally because we're more focused on the prime players and what's really, what is the central drama that's going on in a passage. And sometimes we miss the significance of important words. I want to be sure we don't do it. As Gabriel has come to bring a message to Mary that she, in regarding to her virgin motherhood of the Messiah. And there are four key words, and we're going to look at them this morning. The word behold, the word bond slave, be it done. And the word, your word. In the first doctrinal word, behold, it's an exclamation. It's Eden. It's an imperative. And it's an exclamation. Behold. What we don't get by that is we don't understand the meaning, so we skip that word. We immediately skip that word, the word behold. We go, eh, well, I don't know why she would say that. What does that possibly mean? Well, it was probably old ancient stuff. You know, it's probably old stuff. Probably has no real bearing. It is enormously important when she says, behold. Because what, the, what Gabriel has told her is going to be life-changing. Her life will never be the same again. And she's getting a little bit of view of that. And when she responds, behold, that's an enormous statement. This word in the Greek language is used with the idea is you have my undivided attention. This word, behold, has the idea in the Greek language, you have my undivided attention. 
I'm all ears. I'm ready to serve you now in any way. Word behold. All of that is in that word behold. In 1 Corinthians, write it down. In 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verse 35, Paul refers to this idea that's behind the word behold as undistracted devotion to Christ. Undistracted devotion to Christ. And boy, is she going to need it, just like you and I. It was her word, it was her word of immediate, immediate response of her faith and trust in whatever God had want, wanted from her life. You're my father. I live to do your will. And not my own. Your will for mine trumps mine. All of that is in this little word, behold. She was willing to tell God that she was at peace in the hands of God, no matter what the circumstances of her life might come from his directive will, from her virgin motherhood. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that a powerful idea? As a spiritual mature believer, Mary understood at, le at least this one idea about the heart of God. It would serve you well to know in your heart this one thing about the heart of God. When he gives you, when he reveals to you from his word, his directive will, what he wills for your life. It's found in Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews. You didn't bring your Bible to Bible study? Are you, do, you, do you have clothes on? Did you eat breakfast? Are you going to eat lunch? Where's your Bible? Get your Bible. Now look up Hebrews 11.6. This is a very important point. It is all attached to the word behold. I mean, what did you think behold means? You had no idea all of that was there, did you? That's why I'm your teacher. I'm telling you, all of this is wound up in the mind and heart of Mary as she is responding to the, to the directive will of God regarding virgin motherhood. Here's, here's what she knows about the heart of God so that she can put her life in the hands of God and not worry about it. Be at peace. Listen to this. Without faith, where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing in order to understand and believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Hearing, hearing the word of God, understanding it and believing it, that becomes faith. The hearing becomes faith when I believe it. Without faith, watch this now, it is impossible. You got to circle that word. You don't get that word much in your life on a positive side. You usually get it on a negative side. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. For, he says, let me explain. 
For he who comes to God must believe that God exists. He is. I am that I am. And that he is. See, that's twice he is. First time that he is God. That he is God Almighty. He is El Shaddai. I can create something out of nothing. Bara in the Hebrew. Those who come to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. See, that's who Mary is today. In the word behold. The word behold. <laughs> Oh, isn't that wonderful? Aren't you happy you came today? Aren't you? You learned something about a, a wonderful little word in the Greek language used as an exclamation. This is from the heart of Mary to the heart of God. Having received, having received the directive will of God regarding Virginia, virgin motherhood. Here's the second word. The second word that Mary told God was bond slave. I'm a bond slave of the Lord. Behold, she says, behold. Behold the bond slave of the Lord. She identifies, she gives a, that, God didn't give her that title. She gave that title to God from her. I'm a servant, bond, the, one day if you, go, if you go and pick up our study guide, you will see the word he. That's a definite article in the Greek language, and then doule. When that ends in an L-E, that's female. If it's an L-O-S, that's a male. This is a female believer who takes the role of a servant because she wants the Lord to be her master. And she understands her role, and she wants that role. I don't, I don't want your role. I want my role. I want your will to be such as I submit to, not vice versa. I don't expect you to submit to my will, but I do, I do understand and, ex and know that you expect me to submit to yours just like his son had to. Bond slave. And then the word, of course, kurios, the word Lord. Now here's what you need to know about this word slave, dule, or servant. Spiritual bondage of Adam's original sin is a basic doctrine that is solved by grace salvation. By that I mean that bond slave or a slave, a doule in this idea of a woman, a woman under Adamic sin or a man under Adamic sin is a slave to sin. They are born in the slave market of Adam's sin because they're a human being. Genesis 2, 16, 17 tells us that uh, connected with Paul's explanation of it in Romans 5.12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, and so that death that one man was Adam, and so that, that death passed upon all men for all have sinned in Adam. That's Romans 5.12 through 21. I just dealt with verse 12. Because of Genesis 2, 16, 17, where they were told, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they die and you will die, in the Hebrew. In Genesis, the third chapter, they did eat from the tree and die, and they did die. They died spiritually, and then they later died physically. The spiritual penalty for sin was passed on to the human race. Uh, you know, 
When you have the time, you ought to read this stuff. Romans 5th chapter. Slave market is sin. A slave or a sinner, a slave sinner, is one of 13 judicial charges in under uh, charges under Adamic's original sin, Adam's original sin. And that little pamphlet, 50 things that you receive at salvation called free on our website, doctoralstudies.com. You should read it. Pull it down, print it off, and read it. There are 13 judicial charges that were all removed by Jesus Christ on the cross, his burial and resurrection. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, 13 judicial charges, such as slaves of Adam's sin. There's no way you can get out of it. A man has to be born outside the slave market to redeem those inside the slave market. That man born outside the slave market was Jesus Christ through virgin conception. This is found in our passage of Luke 1, 26 through 38. That's why Jesus can say, no man can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. We are all born in the slave market of Adam's sin, separated from God. And the only way back is through the gospel of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ dies for our sin, Adam's sin, dies for that sin package, is buried and raised on the dead the third day. It's called the gospel. Romans 1, 16. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe it. Romans 1, 16. Ephesians 2, 8. Therefore, we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourself is a gift of God, not of works. We are removed from the slave market. We are freed we have purchased the redemptive price of purchasing us out of the slave market was the spiritual death of Christ on the cross, his blood. To free you from the slave market of sin. You should read, well, let's just, Romans. Ro let's go to Romans, the sixth chapter a moment. Let's show you some stuff here. Romans 6. Romans 6, 6. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That was verse 5. 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, yep, that, that body of sin, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. What is the sin that we're all under? Adam's sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him nor us. Listen to... 16, same pass, same Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, master, slave, servant, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that, that though you were slaves to sin, you have become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you have now become slaves of righteousness. He says, I'm speaking in human terms, uh, human terms about spiritual principles or doctrines. Did you get all that? <laughs> Romans 6, 6 through 8. Romans 6, 6 through 8. Romans 6, 17 through 18, 19. And wonderful. <laughs> and wonderful. See, we're all born slaves in the slave market of sin. And it takes one born outside it 
to redeem those inside it. And the price he pays for them is required by God, and that was his blood. Behold the Lamb of God, Romans, uh, John 10, 1, 129. Behold the Lamb of God that's come all right, for the sin of the world. The Lamb of God that's come to shed his blood for the sin of the world. Every member of the human race is set free from the slave market of Adam's sin. The whole, the whole kit and caboodle of 13 judicial charges by the grace gospel of Jesus Christ. We call that positional freedom. Galatians 5.1 It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing firm in faith. And do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery from which you've been freed. I know you missed this. You don't pay attention. It was for what? That I was set free. At Galatians 5.1. It was for what reason? For what reason was I set free by Christ? And what was I set free from? The slave market of Adam's sin. For what reason? For what reason was I set free? And I was set free. How was I set free? I was set free by the moment I believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came as the Lamb of God to shed his blood on that cross, to remove Adam's sin from my life. But why? Why was I set free? See, that's the point that Paul is trying to make to you and I in Galatians 5.1. He said it was for freedom. What type of freedom? Spiritual freedom. You say, I've never heard that before. <laughs> it's been in the Bible forever. If you'd read your Bible every day, you'd read that. If you just read the book, if you just, look, 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 look. Just read chapter 5 of Galatians. It, it, it will change your life as much as, the, as what Gabriel told Mary. I mean, just, it's a short chapter. Not long chapters, not like war and peace. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. That's not what Mary's talking about. <laughs> Mary has it, but that's not what Mary's talking about. Mary's talking about the freedom that Christ has set me free to live in. To the freedom. What Mary is talking about as a spiritual mature believer in Jesus Christ, not, not a young baby who's just gotten saved, but a spiritual mature believer in Christ, what Mary's talking about is about the freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set her free. That's what she's talking about is not positional freedom that comes at the point of salvation. It's experiential freedom that comes from living our life as unto the Lord, understanding not my will, but thy will be done. I'm comfortable in your hands, whatever you will for my life. I'm acceptable of that. It's okay with me. I'd rather be in your hands than any other hands in the world. That's called experiential freedom. This comes from her submission through her spiritual growth to understand that the will of God trumps everything. And where does the will of God come? The word brings you to the will and the will to the work. There's a life of Mary. And she's young. Mary's a teenager. Not some old lady. Well, she ought to have that, but eh, she's a young person. Listen, and listen, what the Lord's going to tell her is going to shake her world to the core. 
And you ought to read the rest of that story. As a spiritually mature believer, Mary has chosen, has chosen to live her life daily under experiential freedom. She has chose to live her life under the banner of the freedom in Christ. It was for freedom. It was for freedom. You know what freedom is? It's walking in the power of the Spirit, not in the flesh. It is the power of walking by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not sight. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, walk in the power of the Spirit and not in the weakness of the flesh. That's, what free, that's spiritual freedom. That's living in the freedom that God has established for us. It was for freedom that we've been set free. Let me show you. I'm going to go back to the book of Galatians. I think I may, may have it on my paper. Let me see if I got Galatians. Yeah, I wrote. No, nah, I didn't write it down. I'm going to look up Galatians. Hey, look it up with me. Galatians, the fifth chapter, where we were. Fifth chapter, verse 13. I thought I wrote that on your paper someplace. I think I just put, I think I just wrote down the Bible verse. Listen to what Paul said. Now he said, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Now watch what he says. Watch what he says now in verse 13, because he says something different. For you were called to freedom, brethren... You were, called, you were called to live in spiritual freedom, brethren. He's talking about all believers in Jesus Christ. What's that mean? This is what he says. This is what he says. Only do not turn your freedom into opportunity for the flesh. Don't walk in the flesh. But through, through love, serve one another. Don't walk in the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you walk in wisdom. You walk in freedom. You don't walk by sight. No, no, no. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. If you do, then you are living it. You are, you are living the freedom for which Christ set you free. Are you getting any of this? I mean, I, I don't know what to do. I can't make you believe it. I can't even make you study it. You would be well, it would be well worth your little bit of time to do it. This is life-changing stuff I'm giving you today. It is life-changing stuff. This is what Mary has in the Christmas story. This is, this is the message of Christmas. It's certainly the message for you this Christmas and for me. The third important doctrinal word that Mary used, be it done to me. It is the word ginomai. 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 It's an aorist middle operative. And we very seldom see this operative in the Greek language. And you can't see it in the English at all. But it is a wish or a desire of the heart. It is a wish or desire of the heart. At Christmas time, we'll, people will say, well, tell Sandy what you want. What is your wish? Tell Sandy what your wish is. For the, the adult is tell God. Tell God. The operative is the wish, but now look how Mary used it. Be it done to me as genomai, it's a aorist, meaning right now I understand your will. 
Put it operative. Listen, you don't have a problem with my heart. My heart's desire is to do your will. My heart desire is to, is to live to please you and not myself. I am a bond slave. I'm a servant who understands the chain of command. And I would rather have it that way than any other way of my life. I want to sleep with, you, with your strong arms around me. I want to live. I want to live my daily life where you are leading me beside the still waters into green pastures. Be it done to me. This statement reveals Mary's state of mind as a spiritual mature believer. The question I might pose to Mary at this point as a pastor. Mary, suppose the devil asked permission as he did with Peter to sift you as wheat. Like in Luke 22, 31, 32. Mary might pause and reflect. This is what Mary's going to say. Then I will be prepared to fight the good fight of faith to the finish line until the battle is over. <laughs> I love Mary. What a heart for God. Be it done to me. You have no idea what she surrendered. You know, we, we sing that song, I Surrender All. And the only, the only all is in the song. When the song is over, that deal is over. I surrender all. I'm telling you, you ought to. Mary did. And every mature believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is asked to do that. I surrender all. As a spiritual mature super grace believer, Mary, by her own volition, had chosen to live her daily life by undistracted devotion to the directive will of God and not be dictated by the circumstances of her life. Go, Mary. Go, go Mary. Let me tell you, a few Marys in your church, you could conquer the world. In spite of a virus. The fourth word in closing is attached to let it be done to me. This is really important. The fourth word that Mary gave is attached to the idea, be it done to me. She said, according to your word. Boy, that's what Jesus said when going to the cross, not my will, but thy will be done, and marched, him, marched himself to the cross, was nailed, spent six hours there for the sins of mankind. And when it was time for it to be finished, he said, it is finished. He gave up his spirit and spent three days in Sheol before God raised him from the dead. You know what that was? It was this attitude, be it done to me according to your word. It's the way you're supposed to live. That's the way I'm supposed to live. The church isn't living that way. And the world knows it, and they're not attracted to us. They would be if they could believe that we had something real. If 
if we were the real deal. The fourth important word is this. See that word, word according to your word? That's not logos. That's rima. That's rima with a definite article. And it means, it means categorical doctrine that is outlined, uh, categorical doctrine, the details of the directive will of God always is given. Listen, in this case, the doctrine is the virgin motherhood. The details is given in the message G uh, Goliath gave Mary. And that's Rima. And she understands that and she says that. Be it done to me according to the directive will of God just laid out on virgin motherhood, just like it was laid out in detail to me. That's categorical Bible. Doct Rima stands for categorical Bible doctrine. Because of her spiritual growth maturity, Mary has the capacity and capability of bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and she's just demonstrated 2 Corinthians 10.5. Rima, Rima has a categorical Bible doctrine, a categorical Bible doctrine that has details of that doctrine. It's the key to understanding how spiritual growth is developed in a believer's life from babyhood to immaturity to spiritual maturity. Like 1 Peter 2.2, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, Ephesians 4, 13. Rima is how the directive will of God is revealed to spiritually advancing believers, both with the security of their salvation doctrines and then the basic doctrines of the Christian life that carry him through immaturity to maturity and the maturity doctrines that take him into super grace life of 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. That is the story of Mary. When Mary says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word, that was her response. To the directive will laid out on the virgin motherhood of her life, laid out in details, point one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, you say, well, you know, she's Mary. Uh-uh. She was just Mary. The significance of her life is because she ran, surrendered to the will of God. She was Mary. She was nobody from nowhere. Go pull that card out of me. Well, Mary, uh, pull that on me. This is in the word of God for you and I. God is looking for that person that has a heart of God, that has a heart for God. Let us pray. Let me, get, let me take a moment with you. Here we sit on the eve of Christmas. What are you doing with your life? You feel like you're a nobody going nowhere? A nobody from, some, from nowhere going nowhere? My, my. You need to learn to live in the freedom that Christ has set you free, and you'll find a magnificent, a magnificent, exciting life in Christ. I need to see you Sunday. I need to see you in this church on Sunday. I'll bring you another message from the Luke 1, 26 to 38 that will be life-changing. I'll see you Sunday. 930.
right here. If you're within a 40 mile radius for one hour, face to face, I want to meet you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We've explained the passage. We've explained Mary's heart. We've explained your will. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Breaker. Father, may the scriptures, as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 7 says, may it be profitable in all the ways necessary to improve our relationship with God. In Jesus' name, amen.